Welcome to week zero of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. So these are some brew ideas that I've been coming up with over the weekend pre-release, and um, also some ideas that I snagged from other people so uh, that caught my attention. And uh, so this one is Is It Dragons by Bo, who uh, has been doing some of the deck list creation on MTGA Zone. And so this one's a new archetype, and it's going to lean heavily into dragon synergies. So we don't have this on Arena yet, which is why we're going to have to use Aether Hub. So it's going to be a little bit harder to see the cards, so I hope everything's okay. Um, but we've got Shiv and Devastator, which we can play on curve as a XX Flying Haste. Um, and we've got Invasion of Tarkir, which uh, is nice interaction. It gets better the more dragons that you can reveal to deal damage to um, any other target. And then we've got Sahili, Sun's Brilliance, and the idea here is we're going to be playing a bunch of cards that can copy dragons, and then we're going to be playing busted dragons. So Sahili, the Sun's Brilliance, can tap to create a token that's a copy of another creature or artifact that you control, and then it's an artifact and you have to sacrifice it at the beginning of your next end step. Um, Sarkhan, Soul of Flame, you may know this card pretty well for if you do play Commander. Um, but it makes your dragon spell cost one less, and then whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, you may have it become a copy of it until end of turn. And um, so that works with your our dragon synergies. We've got the Aetherian, oops, sorry, Aetherian Hero of Lava Brink, which is another way to create uh, more, even more copies of tokens. And then we've got Sol Solfim. If a source you would control would deal non-combat damage to an opponent, um, it deals double that damage to that player or permanent instead. And this is going to be important for one of our uh, one of our dragons being able to double its damage. So uh, we've got Stingerback Terror, which is a new card from Outlaws at Thunder Junction, and it's a seven-seven flying trample for two double pip red. But it gets minus one minus one for each card in our hand. But it does have plot. And uh, I do think that the one downside with this um, deck is that its curve is a little bit on the high side. So, and I do think it's a little bit mana intensive with being able to, you know, like tap for Ethereum and things like that. So I'm not 100% sold on the four copies of Stingerback Terror, but it is a place to start, right? Um, four copies of the Bonehorde Dracosaur, which was one that we got in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, gives you a 5-5 flying first strike, and then... Um, creates 3-1 dinosaur tokens or helps dig and create treasure tokens from the top of your library. Absolutely busted card. And then we've got the real shining star of this deck and really the point of this whole deck is Terror of the Peaks, which uh, we've seen before, but it's returning to standard. So we get a 5-4 flying for three double pip red uh, spells. Your opponents cast at target Terror of the Peaks cost an additional three life to cast. And then whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. So um, if you could play down like a Stingerback Terror for its full power, it would just deal seven damage to anything that you would like. And then we're going to run three copies of the Virtue of Knowledge, which allows us to copy activated or triggered abilities. So you can use this to uh, there's so many activated and triggered abilities in this deck, um, not just Terror of Peaks. But you could, you know, any any of these, um, you could you could hit it for uh, cheap. So you're going to be playing this for the adventure side, not so much the uh, enchantment effect. And then um, one copy of uh, Kyrie, the Swirling Sky, which is a six six flying ward three uh, for four double pip blue. When it enter, uh, when it dies, return any number of non-land permanents with total mana value six or less to their owner's hands so you can bounce or mill six cards and then return up to two instant and or sorcery cards from your graveyard to your hand and then we've kind of just got your classic like is it fixing next up on the list is a brew of my own and this one is gruel aggro or gruel combat tricks and uh, we've seen this one kind of flirting with being a top tier archetype and i think that it has the tools to to make it in outlaws at thunder junction so uh, we're starting things off with the like Anc ancestral anger is a way to increase the power of our creatures, but also remain card neutral. Same thing with audacity. So when when audacity is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you draw a card. So both of these allow us to kind of do that combat trick thing, but also not run out of options. Giant growth um, gives us plus three plus three for one, but it doesn't replace itself. 
Um, Kumano faces Kakazans, classic red card, right? You, you get to increase the power of something that you're going to play. And then there's a 2-2 as well, and it pings everything, uh, your opponent and their Planeswalkers for one when you play it. So just a lot of value for one red. Um, I'm deciding to run two copies of the Mirror and Bane Splitter. Uh, this one, I think, has kind of fallen out of popularity. Um, if you go back in and look at some of my meta reviews for um, Murders at Karlov Manor, you'll notice that... Um, there was a Gruul aggro uh, deck list. I think it was like week three or week four, kind of early on in Murders at Karlov Manor that was mostly mono red, except for the Questing Druid. And so this is leaning a little bit more heavy into the green because I really want to be able to play Snakeskin Veil. Vale. Um, but Bane Splitter, you know, you, like, you don't have to play. I just think that it works nicely. Um, it, it's a nice instant that then can leave you with an artifact that you can then move around to increase the power of your other creatures, like Picnic Runer. It's nice to permanently make this into four power so it always has double strike before combat. Um, but the the new card that I'm really thinking is going to put this over the top is Snakeskin Veil. Vale. And we've had we've seen this one before. So and it's a, it's returning to standard. So for one green you, at an instant speed, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control and it gains hexproof until end of turn. So I don't know how many copies are going to be ideal for this. I'm going to start things off with two because we do want to be more aggressive than reactive in this strategy. Um, but I do think that this will be a nice way to kind of prevent them answering like the Picnic Runer. Um, I decided to run one copy of Inti, Cynical of the Sun. Um, this kind of gives us nice dig as well as increasing the general power of our creatures like Picnic Runer. And then, uh, yeah, four copies of Picnic Runer and four copies of the Pyrotechnic Performer. And this one works kind of uh, pretty nicely as a morph creature that you can then undisguise to deal direct damage to their face. And if you do like a giant growth on it, it flips over and deals power equal to its... Um, deals damage equal to the sorry it deals damage to the opponent equal to its power so with the giant growth you can flip this over and hit for six and then if it's unblocked you're hitting for 12. Um, you may note that i decided to cut the cacophony scamps um, and that was one of the ways that this deck was hitting kind of for a quasi double strike and um, being able to sacrifice the cacophony scamp allows you to deal its damage twice and so but i, I was kind of it was kind of hit and miss and so i decided to lean away with it or lean away from it. Um, Questing Druid I decided to keep though because this um, not only is it a creature that grows every time that you're playing a red spell, um, but it is also the adventure side of it allows you to dig. And if you can't quite get the job done in your first attempt, then Questing Druid's adventure is a great way to refuel. And then another card that we're getting from Outlaws at Thunder Junction that I think will work quite well um, is the Slick Shot Show Off. So this is a one, two, flying haste for one and a red. And whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. And it has plot. So we can we can plot it and then have it come down on a turn where we have the mana to immediately do the giant growths and such. Or we can just do it as a turn two after playing Kumano. And then we have a two, three flying haste that gets bigger every time that we cast one of our combat spells. But I think it slots perfectly into this archetype. And um, yeah, and... I was, and and then um uh, just a bunch of oh yeah icono uh Yavmea iconoclast i decided to run this one because like if you are going to run the picnic runers then i think this is a nice one to follow up on turn three because it comes down as a four three uh trample and haste uh it immediately triggers your picnic runer so if, if you're going to decide to cut the pi picnic runers then i'd probably come down a little bit on the iconoclasts all right, number three on the list here is Rakdos Crimes, which was a deck that caught my attention from MTG Creative Combos. And they are a fellow Magic the Gathering content creator, and they've got a, uh, a small but growing YouTube channel. So I can highly recommend checking them out, and I'll definitely put the link to their channel in the description. Um, they've come up with some really creative ideas, thus the name, right, <laughs> uh, for like instant turn like one, one turn kill combos in outlaws at thunder junction and uh, this one's not that this one's just more highly synergized in committing crimes so we've got um two copies of duress to attack our opponent's hand uh three or four copies of the forsaken miner which is a, a new card from outlaws and it's a two two that can't block for one black whenever you commit a crime which is basically targeting your opponent, right? Uh, whenever you cast an instant that targets your opponent or has an activated ability that targets your opponent, and that's committing a crime. And 
Um, so then this becomes a recurring threat that just comes back to your hand. Uh, three copies of Play With Fire that, you know, deals the two damage, triggering a crime. Uh, we've got the Tiny Bones Joins Up, which is a legendary enchantment that we got from Outlaws. And uh, when you enter the battlefield, it triggers a crime because it makes your opponent discard a card. And um, then legendary creatures entering the battlefield under your control mill and lose one life. And there's actually a fair amount of legendary creatures that this list is deciding to run. So it might be better off being called like Rakdos Legends than like Rakdos Crimes. Um, but then we've also got the Tiny Bones the Pickpocket, which is a legendary creature that kind of goes with the Tiny Bones joins up. And then whenever it deals damage, you can cast a permanent from that player's uh, graveyard and you can use mana of any type to cast that spell. So milling them from the enchantment and then gives you things that you can play. And also because you're targeting them and playing something from their graveyard, it is triggering a crime. So i um, curious how, to, how this one's going to play. And in an aggressive strategy, we've seen the uh, like Billy, Billowis Skull Dweller, um, the 1-1 one, one Death Toucher is just good for getting in early damage. But I think Tiny Bones will fit nicely um, or work nicely. We've got two copies of Go for the Throat for your classic black removal. Three copies of Magda, the Horde Master, which is kind of a payoff for the crimes. So every time that you commit a crime, you're creating a treasure token. And then whenever you can sacrifice three treasure tokens to create a 4-4 red scorpion dragon, and it has flying in haste. That seems like a good threat and a good payoff for committing a bunch of crimes. Uh, we've got Vadmir New Blood, which is another, again, another one from Outlaws. So this list has a lot of the new cards. And uh, whenever you commit a crime, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. It triggers only once each turn. And then as long as it has four or more plus one, uh, plus one, plus one counters on it, then it uh, has menace and lifelink. So eventually this thing just turns into an absolute threat and um, pressures into your opponent and stabilizes you kind of in the mid mid uh, mid part of the game. Uh, we've got Vile Smasher Gleeful Grenadier, which is the signpost for outlaws for Rakdos. And whenever an outlaw enters the battlefield, you uh, deal one damage to that tar to target opponent. So this commits a crime every time that you're playing an outlaw. And an outlaw is an assassin, a mercenary, a pirate, a rogue, a warlock. Um, so a lot of your cards in this list are also outlaws. So we'll, we'll continue to trigger your opponent every time that something enters the battlefield. And then we've also got Kervik the Punisher, which allows us to replay things like Go for the Throat. Any of our black cards that are in our graveyard, when we hit a crime, we can then exile that card and um, copy it. And then you may cast it. So if you do, you you lose two life, but being able to so like being able to double dip into all of our removal, I think is going to be pretty good. And then um, we've got, so yeah, three copies of the Kervik Punisher, We've got three copies of the Laughing Jasper Flint, which um, the creatures that you don't control are outlaws. And that matters because for each outlaw that you control, you you take off X cards from the top of your opponent's library, and then you can cast those cards um, using mana of any type to cast that spell. And so if, if you exile a creature that's not a mercenary, but when you play it at, with Laughing Jasper Flint, it becomes one and then you just start milling more each each turn. Uh, Lord Skitter Sewer King is also a nice enabler. Uh, notably, this commits a crime when you're doing that, when you're milling your opponent. Same with Lord Skitter attacking their graveyard commits a crime every turn. So you have some really great enablers for committing crimes. And um, so, so two copies of Lord Skitter. And then we've got Gissa the Hellraiser, which is one of the busted bombs <laughs> that we got in uh, Outlaws at Thunder Junction, right? So you get a 4-4 four, four for three double pit black with ward to pay two life. Skeletons and zombies you control get plus one, plus one and have menace. And then whenever you commit a crime, you create two tapped 2-2 two, two zombie creature tokens and this ability triggers only once each turn. So you get a huge payoff from being able to commit a crime every single turn. And then, uh, yeah, just classic Rakdos fixing and then... Notably, because we are running a fair amount of legendaries, uh, you, you see Plaza of Heroes coming into the list as well. All right, back to one of my brews. So this is my brew for Azorius Control. And um, I've been messing around with the Azorius Control um, archetype a little bit. I did a 50 match summary where I was talking about how we really needed to bring in Kutzel's Flanker or Teamer Control. And I do think that it's relatively well positioned in the meta. It hasn't really been like a top two or a top three deck, but it's been flirting in the top eight for 
basically all of murders at Carlisle Manor. So we did get some new tools, and I do think that there, there's a couple of different ways that we can kind of approach this archetype. Um, so I decided to cut the March of Otherworldly da Light down to two. It is a really good card against Boros Convoke, um, but I'm going to try seeing if we can get away with only two copies. Um, as far as new cards go, we got Three Steps Ahead, which is a new one from Outlaws. It's a cancel, so you can counter a spell for one double pit blue, or you can pay one blue and three colorless to create a token that's a copy of target uh, artifact or creature that you control. Or you can tap blue and two colorless to draw two cards and then discard a card. Or you can decide to do them all. It's a modal card. Um, so I think there's some really cool flexibility in this. And so not only, like, so you can play it as an additional counter spell if you're up against another control archetype. Because um, usually that comes that match comes down to who's running the most amount of counter spells. Um, if you're not up against another ca uh, control deck and you can then use it to create a copy of some broken, you know, <laughs> creature cards that we got, or you can use it just to draw to and discard a card. And it kind of gives me that um, the Faithless Mending without the life gain. Um, so we can kind of use cards like the Mindbreaker that are good to get into the graveyard um, from from your hand. So I think that this is going to I'm really curious to see how this one slots in and whether or not the cancel is too expensive for the Azorius control archetype, uh, but definitely excited to check it out. Um, I've been playing around with the idea of including one change the equation, which um, allows you to counter target spell with mana value two or less, which is nice in the mirror match because most of the other counter spells are two or less. And then you can also snag someone doing the uh, World Souls Rage in Teamer Control because you can target counter target red or green spell with mana value six or less. So it has to be one of the earlier World Souls Rage, but it can kind of help prevent them from ramping early on. And I, you know, I, th I think it's a fun one to explore. Um, I'm also exploring one copy of the Fateful Absence, which is just really good removal. Uh, they do get a clue token out of it, but since there's kind of a quasi mill theme going on here, then the card draw shouldn't be too much of a problem just, you know, you, you kind of have to be selective, and that's why there's only one. Uh, running two copies of Make Disappear. Um, I think I like the Make Disappears over the um, the artifact ones, if we're going to be cutting Deduce. And um, so I like it over the D Disruption Protocol. Um, one copy of Negate, which again, I think is, you know, I, I brought this one in just for the uh, Teamer Control and Azorius Control matchups. I do think that there's enough interaction in Planeswalkers in the meta that you can kind of main board and negate and not get punished for it too often. Because even the really creature heavy uh, archetypes like Boros Convoke are running targets that this can hit like uh, Case of the Gateway Express or War Leader's Call. So uh, in Mono Red also has the burn spells. So there's not a whole lot on the ladder right now that um, is just like 100% a creature spell deck outside of Mono White. And I bump into that one very rarely. Um, so we're running the four copies of No More Lies, which is a staple at this point. Um, being able to exile the the spell for a, a mana sink or a, a mana leak. And then four copies of the Kutzel's Flanker, which I talked about. Um, this is particularly good against Teamer Control, as well as maybe like I'm speculating that maybe we'll see more of the Golgari Root stacks. And uh, so Kutzel's Flanker allows us to exile target player's library. That's the really big part. It's also halfway decent in mono red because it comes into play gaining two life and scry two, and you can use it to trade up against, you know, trade into one of your opponent's attackers. So it can it can work in that as well. Um, and we're going to run one copy of Realm Breaker, the invasion tree. I really like having mill options when it comes to the mirror match um, rather than playing out the entirety of a control V control. And so Realm Breaker is one of our kind of win conditions against the grindier matchups. We've got three copies of Temporary Lockdown, which um, during the 50 match summary, I thought it was I thought three copies of Temporary Lockdown was good enough. Um, I don't think we need four to fight off the Boros Convoke. Three kind of gives us enough options to because like Temporary Lockdown is a dead card when you come up against like Azorius Control or, or you know, near dead. It gets rid of Myrix, uh Mites, but um, so because it can be a dead card, I don't like running four, and I think we can kind of get away with three. So one copy of Celestis, which is pretty standard, and uh, this is the other new card that we got in Outlaws at Thunder Junction is the Stoic Sphinx, which is a 5-3 flash for two double pit blue, and uh, you get a 5-3 flyer that has hexproof as long as you haven't cast a spell this turn. And so I think this one is going to work really nicely. Um, 
as an alternative win condition. So instead of just leaning specifically on mill, I think that we can uh, Stoic Sphinx, I think itself can act as a way to destroy your opponent, because as long as you haven't cast anything, your opponent can't deal anything, you know, can't target this with a spell. But, you know, Hexproof is always scary to see. So uh, I'm definitely excited to play a full play set of this and see if it does work as an alternative win condition. And then um, I decided to bring in three different Planeswalkers. So Teferi, who, who slows the sunset, works pretty nicely with uh, Realm Breaker, the Invasion Tree, and the Celestis. Being able to untap your artifacts has nice synergy. Um, Teferi Temporal Pilgrim. There's a, a fair amount of card draw that um, this deck can do and uh, it, you know, with, with the Celestis and such. So you can create some pretty big threats with this. And then um, I haven't... I don't mind just having it as a repeatable draw card that they have to put damage into to get rid of. So I've been pretty impressed with the uh, one copy of the Teferi Temporal Pilgrim and then one copy of the Wandering Emperor because I did cut the Sunfalls and the Farewells. And so if this deck needs a little bit more of a board wipe, we might need to bring those back in. Um, but for now, I'm going to try running it without it and leaning more into the counter spells to take care of the larger board states. So we'll see how like the timeline for Stoic Sphinx should allow us to close more quickly than the mill option in the past. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, the Wandering Emperor allows us to cl uh, cleanse the board if we fall too far behind, and then can also just give us um, some good threats as well as remove problematic blo blockers, and um, it's kind of an alternative win condition as well. And then four copies of the Teresian Mindbreaker. And this is a card that I haven't really seen a lot in in most Azorius control lists, but I like running it. I think that especially when you're up against other Azorius control, then being able to mill everything is is a way to kind of beat your opponent um, if, it be, if it's a really grindy matchup. Uh, the one downside with Mindbreaker in the past was that because it can never mill out your opponent entirely, uh, they usually get a turn or two where they have a ton of their graveyard, or a ton of their library in their graveyard. And the solution to this is because we're running four copies of the Kutzel's Flanker. So being able to unearth this, mill them for a ton, play Kutzel's Flanker, exile that um, graveyard so that they don't get any of the synergies, I think will make the, the Mindbreaker a little bit better. Now, notably, because Mindbreaker can't finish them with the mill entirely, you could run three copies of Jace instead of the, you know, Teferi's and the Eternal Wanderer. Um, it's probably more consistent for the mill victory, but without actually knowing how often we're going to be winning through damage, I decided to lean away from it. So, and then we just have a bunch of Azorius uh, fixing, I, and uh, I don't think we got any... We, we got a couple of new... Uh, fast lands, but I don't think, and I don't think we really want to run fast lands in Azorius anyway. Um, but yeah. Oh man, yeah, doing this in one take is always an interesting experience. So you know, I'm I'm happy that it it. <laughs> uh, we're just a bunch of nerds geeking out about magic cards, right? So it it's all good. It doesn't have to be like the premium uh, <laughs> presentation. So. Next up here is Is It Pirates? And this one's an archetype that I had my eye on because so you could take it in a very um, creature synergy way. And I've decided to go more towards the artifact synergies. So Is It Artifacts and Is It Pirates have kind of come together in this list. And so we have Case of the Filched Falcon, which gives us a clue token as well as potentially can make a 4-4 flyer. Um, We've got Diamond Pickaxe, which can equip and give something plus one, plus one, and then whenever it attacks, it creates a treasure token. Fading Hope for a little bit of interaction. I really think it's one of Blue's better interaction spells. Four copies of Kumano faces Kakazan. Uh, once again, just a whole bunch of value for one red. Uh, two copies of Spell Pierce to protect the board from Sunfalls and board wipes like Ill-Timed Explosion. Uh, four copies of Spyglass Siren, which is a 1-1 flyer that creates a map token. So you'll notice there's a theme here of a lot of a lot of things creating artifacts as well as being pirates. Um, Sticky Fingers is kind of like Diamond Pickaxe, where whenever a creature um, deals combat damage to a player, that creates a treasure token, but it, it gives the creature menace. Um, and then the reason, like one of the, the payoffs of having all of these artifacts is Dousing Device. 
And dousing device gives your, uh, whenever an artifact enters the battlefield, a creature gets plus one plus zero and gains haste until end of turn. But the more important side of it is that it flips into a land, which ramps us. And then I don't have a really easy way to show you the backside of the card, so I apologize for that. Um, but you can then tap two and a red to give a creature plus X plus zero, where X is the number of artifacts that you control. And with this list, you can end up with a ton. So this is kind of one of the win conditions of the deck. Uh, Gleaming Gear Drake is an art is like two artifact cards in one um, because when it enters the battlefield, it creates a clue token. And then whenever you sacrifice an artifact, you put a plus one plus one counter on it, which should work for using our treasures and such. Um, we've got three copies of Make Disappear because it, it, I think this deck will play out. Um, well, <laughs> this deck should play out as a, somewhat of a tempo deck. And so I, I, I like Make Disappear for those tempo plays. It can be used as well against like a Sunfall um, or like if you don't have the Spell Pierce in your hand. Uh, we've got the Malcolm Alluring Scoundrel. And I really like this one, especially in the control matchups. <laughs> Um, there were some lists that were looking at leaning into the pirate synergies and making Malcolm trigger multiple turns with like Roaming Throne on pirate. Um, I haven't found that to be totally necessary with the alluring scoundrel drawing cards and then discarding and like it just it does help bury your it, like it's a, it's a must answer threat um, in the grindy matchups for the control lists. And then as far as the new cards that we got, we got wanted Malcolm the eyes and um, or sorry, <laughs> Malcolm the Eyes. And so we get a 2-2 Flying Haste for a blue and a red. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, which you'll note is this is a very low curve. Um, whenever you cast your second spell each turn, you create a clue token. So Pirate naturally tying into that artifact synergies. And then uh, Kite Cell Larcenist is good removal. You get a Flying Ward 1 Pirate that can remove an opponent's thing and turn it into a treasure token. And you can also do it to your own. So like if you'd like to turn your map token into a treasure token, then Kite Sail Larcenist allows you to do that. And we've got one copy of Witch Stalker Frenzy, which <laughs> honestly was just kind of like I was one card short. And um, I think I think that having a little bit more just hard removal outside of the fading hopes in case we come up against a, uh, a problematic thing that we just can't get over, I think could work nicely. Um, and then after that, we basically just got your um, blue white or blue red uh, fixing. And then we did get the uh, the fast land in is it so spire spire bluff canal. Uh, if you have two or fewer, you can tap for blue and a red. We got the, uh, the is it fast land, which I think in this kind of tempo strategy uh, will work quite nicely. All right, next up on the list is uh, my approach to teamer control, and uh, I've been playing around with this one, too. I think that the, there's a couple of different ways to go about the teamer control list. So I just ran a 50 match summary on this one this last weekend as well. And um, so I started playing around with some alternative strategies, and one of them is light up the night. And if you go and you look at my best of three sideboard guide for teamer control, um, this is a pretty good card against mono red because it allows us to basically do the world soul's rage a turn sooner. Um, but it doesn't trigger the landfall, so it doesn't pair as well with Nissa Resurgent Animist. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be trying to copy our X damage spells to, to kind of end the game a little bit sooner than the previous list. Um, so we have four copies of Aftermath Analyst. This is a kind of a bread and butter card. Because for six total mana, you can bring back all of your lands from your graver to the battlefield tapped. And uh, you're playing all these sack lands that can then bring back, er, look through your deck and find other lands. So they trigger double landfall. Um, Doppelgang is an alternative win condition where we can copy our virtue of strengths. Um, just have an obscene amount of mana, uh, as well as just our opponent's threats. This, this deck gets an absurd amount of mana. So if you do this for X equals three, you get nine copies and... Um, can just be a win condition in and of itself. And then Galvanic Iteration is the one, um, again, that if you go back to the best of three sideboard guide, you can see Galvanic Iteration pop up specifically against Mono Red. And Galvanic Iteration allows you to copy your next spell for a blue and a red. So um, ideally you do this to win the game. You don't have to. It does have flashback and, and there are other spells that are beneficial for double spelling, even like a Memory Deluge, an Ill-Timed Explosion. To dig for additional threats can be done in a pinch. And um, I was torn between whether or not to include two copies of Shigeki Jukai Visionary. Um, the list I was running on the weekend was running two. I've decided to drop it down to one 
And uh, I do think that the deck can get by with just doing one. You will have to be a little bit more conservative, um, uh, depending on what, like being able to read what your opponent is doing early um, to decide whether or not to use this to ramp or to use this to get back your additional stuff uh, if they're planning on uh, counterspelling your World Souls Rage. The World Souls Rage is the main win condition of the deck, and um, I decided to bring World Souls Rage down to three copies because we are running the fourth copy of Light of the Night, um, and then four copies of Nissa Resurgent Animist, which pairs nicely with the Aftermath Analyst or with World Souls Rage, being able to give us additional lands, and I decided to include the one copy of Spelunking because... Um, then the lands that are coming back from the sack lands from Aftermath Analyst are coming into play untapped, and so it gives us even more mana. So with Anissa in play, you can get three mana per sack land instead of just two, and uh, really give us a burst where we can hit into our more expensive cards. We've got four ill-timed explosions, which is uh, the kind of like wrath of choice for this deck. And we've got two copies of Kellen, which allow us to ramp ahead of the mirror match, uh, um, get ahead of our opponent in lands, and then also is a 3-4 body um, that can work nicely defensively. Um, we've got four copies of Memory Deluge to dig to our threats. Uh, when we have a whole ton of mana, we won't have a problem casting the Memory Deluge for 11 and um, finding, you know, digging very, very deep for your World Soul's Rage. Um, we've got one copy of the Bonnie Paul Clear Cutter because, you know, it's Outlaws at Thunder Junction. There's got to be at least one Outlaw card, right? And so I decided that this is the one. This is the one that I'm excited to explore. Um, you get a 6-5 reach for three, a green, and double pit blue. Um, but it spawns a ox that is at power and toughness is equal to the number of lands that you control. And in this deck, it's not uncommon to get all of your lands into play. So the ox token creature could be huge on this. And then whenever you attack, you draw a card, and then you can play a land from your hand or your graveyard, which works with the double landfall theme. Um, you know, being able to bring back a broker's hideout. Uh, at that point, you're kind of looking at, like, win conditions, so I'm not actually sure if this should just be, like, a fourth uh, World Souls Rage, but I'm definitely uh, willing to explore it. And then I decided to go with the three copies of Virtue of Strength, which I do think is enough. I don't think you need four. Um... But this is this is what allows you to get into absurd amounts of land. And then we have 30 lands in the deck because these sack lands don't remain in play. Uh, they come in and then are bounced back and or like go. Sorry, they are sacrificed. Let you go get a land that stays in play tapped uh, or untapped if you have spelunking. But they, because they don't actually stay on the battlefield, they don't really count as a land. So um, you definitely need to run a higher number of lands than you might want to um, if you haven't tried playing the deck yet. All right, next up on the list is my uh, my approach to Esper midrange. And <laughs> I had a lot of fun with uh, brewing this one because I do think that Esper midrange is undergoing some changes. And we kind of saw... So if you go back in time, um, Esper midrange used to be Esper Legends and Esper Midrange, and they varied depending on whether or not you were running more legendary creatures or if you were running more towards like the enchantment of Wedding Announcement and Virtue of Loyalty and a little bit less of the legendary synergies specifically. And um, all, op all of the copies, have, I mean, the, one, the one solid that has remained steady throughout is Rafine. <laughs> so Rafine is going to be there, and that's the reason why we're in Esper. Um, but we've got three copies of Cut Down, which is really great removal in black, helps us survive the early um, pressure from our opponents. We've got two copies of Bitter Triumph, which uh, allows us to destroy target creature or planeswalker for one in a black, but at the cost of three life. So it's a cut down, um, but costs three life, but it isn't limited if they are running artifacts. So um been, been playing around with those um, as an alternative to, to go for the throat. Um, or as additional copies to go to go for the throat. Uh, two copies of Dinic Pious Apprentice, which um, is really great for stabilizing against the aggro from our opponents. Um, also prevents our opponents from targeting um, cards and graveyards. Can't be the target of spells or abilities. So uh, Dinic can be a pretty nice way to stop the landfall deck because they can't target their their library. Um, and then we've got the Doorkeeper Thrall, which is another one 
that is is pretty good against the Boros Convoke as well as the Teamer Control. Uh, creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger, so you don't get like the self mill off of the um, Blagi Archaeologist and the um, the one three that I'm blanking on that can uh, the aftermath analyst. Um, it's better against Boros Convoke though, really. Um, we don't have a whole lot of creatures that are creating ETBs, so it doesn't hurt us terribly. There are a couple, uh, there's a handful, but not too much. Um, so I think, you know, it'd be fun to kind of explore that. Um, the card that I really, like, brought me back to Esper Midrange and got me thinking about things was Duelist of the Mind. So this was one that we got from Outlaws at Thunder Junction. You get a star three flying vigilance. And its um, power is equal to the number of cards that you've drawn this turn. And Rafine connives. So whenever you attack, you, you, you connive X, where X is the number of attacking creatures. And so you can end up drawing two, three, four, five times in a single turn with Esper midrange. And if you chose Duelist of the Mind to be the target of Rafine's connive, uh, you would also get the plus one, plus one every time that you're discarding a non-land card. So I think you could make Duelist of the Mind into a very good threat that works quite a bit better than the previous flyers like um, Deep Cavern Bat and um, the Fairy Mastermind and Spyglass Siren and things like that. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I'm really curious to see how this one works and maybe two copies is too low and should probably be brought up to three, but um, we'll have to test it out to see. Um, brought in one copy of Get Lost. I've, I've been enjoying having one of these um, because it does hit creatures, enchantments, or planeswalkers. Uh, we've got three copies of Go for the Throat for your classic black removal. Uh, one copy of Lasav, which allows us to kind of bring stuff back from our um, our graveyard or from our opponent's graveyard um, as a copy. Um, one copy of Long Goodbye, which allows us to destroy target creature or planeswalker with mana value three or less, but can't be countered. Uh, so I've been playing around with that, kind of trying to figure out in my mind, do I want to play Bitter Triumph, Go for the Throat, Anoint with Affliction? Like, what's the ideal mixture there? Uh, Shrouded Shepherd I brought in for against Boros Convoke. It's a nice um, way to kind of eliminate your opponent's tokens. And then if they don't have a really good target, being able to give something plus two, plus two works pretty well as long as you're leaning into the uh, flyers off of Rafine, uh, the flying Rafine strategy. Uh, two copies of the Subterranean Schooner, which works well with the early flyer strategy, being able to uh, buff up their you know power and, um, and toughness every time that you explore. We've got Alquis Proft as a master, uh, master sleuth, and this is kind of um, leaning a little bit back towards the Esper Legend side of things. So I think Alquis Proft was an interesting legend that we got from um, Murders at Carlisle Manor. And so it can... When it enters the battlefield, it investigates, and then you can tap X, a white, a, and double blue to sacrifice a clue and draw X cards and gain X life. So it kind of gives you this kind of like late game alternative, as well as just being a decent mid range threat as a 3 3 that can draw you a card down the line. Um, one copy of Cryptic Coat. This one's another one that, against the really grindy matchups, some, some lists can really struggle, struggle with the recurring threat of Cryptic Coat. So I like including one. Uh, we've got one copy of Lauren of the Third Path, which is kind of in there uh, for the more typical Esper midrange as that's running Wedding Announcement and the Virtue of Loyalty. Um, but Lauren has other targets as well in Boros Convoke against War Leader's Call and Case of the Gateway Express. So uh, playing one there. And then we've got two copies of Path of Peril, which is... Um, a good good answer to domain uh, any anything anytime that the board state gets out of hand right so after they've done like a herd migration and they have five three three counters or whatever then you can use path of peril to kind of um <laughs> recover uh we've got one copy of preacher of the schism and a lot of these one copies are just kind of exploring ideas about um you know which way to take the deck I, you know, should should there be three copies of Doorkeeper Thrall and maybe not one of Preacher and whatnot? You're like it's just you're gonna have to play the set and see what's changed in Outlaws at Thunder Junction to really um, determine what the best strategy is there. So, um, sorry, I bumped my mic there. Uh, one copy uh, or four copies of Rafine. That's the bread and butter that will never change, right? You get a one four flying ward one that you know connives for X, where X is the number of attackers. 
Uh, Tesa, I think, is an interesting one because it spawns clue tokens, which helps us with our card draw, but then also creates 1-1 one, one flyers that kind of boost the go wide Rafine strategy. Uh, one copy of Voidrend because we're in the Esper space and this is like the destroy something can't be countered um, instant Esper spell. Um, playing around with the idea of bringing in one copy of Kaido Dancing Shadow. And um, this is the one that you can make something can't attack or block until your next turn and then you can draw a card this one pairs a little bit better with more interesting etbs which this deck doesn't have or uh, i guess with ninjutsu as well um but we could use it to draw a card and uh you know uh depends on how like it depends on the board state how how well this is going to work um but then we can also just use it to create a body and um when a whenever the creature that you created the 2-2 leaves the battlefield uh, your opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So kind of I'm curious to see how this one plays as like um, sort of like a Wandering Emperor, but not at instant speed. And, um, and we've got two copies of Wandering Emperor. Uh, you know, that one's a classic exile target attacking creature gain two life, create a two two, give something plus one plus one and first strike or it's uptick. Wandering Emperor is busted. And then we've got the uh, Ezrum Agency Chief, which uh, I've been kind of playing around with the idea of adding in one copy of. Because if you have six mana, this comes in as a five five that you can activate into to give it vigilance, lifelink, or hexproof. So um, can be very difficult for your opponent to. Read. So and because we're running a more increased um, amount of legends, but maybe not as high as the original Esper Legends deck, I decided to bring in two copies of the Plaza of Heroes, and. Um, should have written down which ones got the lands and which ones didn't. I don't think. Esper Midrange got any of the new fast lands. Uh, maybe it got the black white ones. I didn't put them in. Anyway, um, that's my take on Esper Midrange. And here we go with uh, Mono Black Aggro. So this is a deck that's under fifty dollars. Um, the other one, the the Is It Pirates deck too, I noticed was particularly inexpensive. So I'll have to double check the price on this, but it, it's a decent um, budget option in paper. Um, but I've Mono Black Aggro has been flirting around with the bottom of the top eight in best of one. And um, it's it's not been quite figured out, right? So we, we've seen a couple of different approaches, uh, some leaning more heavily into the, the Mono Black Aggro of the past. And so this is kind of a mixture of the two um, with some new cards from Outlaws at Thunder Junction. We've got Ashnod, Flesh Mechanist, which is basically um, another copy of Billa's Skull, Skull Dweller. Get it, you know, these 1 1 death touchers that can start getting in for early damage starting on turn one. But it also has the ability to um, turn your creature cards in your graveyard into 3 3 zombie artifact creature tokens. And um, you can also sacrifice some of your uh, fodder if you want to to create the power stone tokens. Um, not that you necessarily would want to do that, it is an option. <laughs> And then um, two copies of Concealing Curtains. This one is a particularly good card against Mono Red. Mono Red can ten, uh, tends to struggle with the four toughness. And then when it flips over into the three four, you can um, make your opponent discard a card so it commits a crime. And there are going to be some crime synergies in black going forward. Um, I do think some of the rares from Outlaws are going to see play. So uh, two copies of Duress, similar to the Rakdos Crimes deck. Um, I, I think there's enough in the meta that's not just a strictly 100% creature spell um, list that we can get away with actually including Duress in the main, in, e even in best of one. And then uh, we've got four copies of the Fairy Dream Thief to do some early pressure in the air. And uh, four copies of the Deep Cavern Bat to... Uh, if, if they're playing another aggro, then the lifelink can kind of help us stabilize against their pressure. But but it really just attacking their hand demands that they have to use removal against the deep cavern bat. And um, it's kind of become a staple in mono black. Uh, we've got two copies of go for the throat, um, classic removal in black, one copy of misery shadow. Some lists were running more than one. Um, I kind of like this one because it, it's a two two grizzly bear. That if an opponent if if a creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead, and that one can be really can be really relevant text in um, in standard, um, and it, and then it because you can pump it for a one colorless, you can threaten and you can attack into some tougher board states and they don't want to block because um, 
you can make this larger. So in previous iterations, yeah, I remember running a list, I think, um, back during like Lost Caverns of Ixalan that was running four copies of Misery Shadow. Um, one copy of Shildred's Edict. Again, I think that there's going to be more Planeswalkers because we're seeing a lot of interaction and a lot of control. So I think having at least some Planeswalker hate in the main makes sense. Uh, two copies of Tenacious Underdog as a recurring threat. Some some decks really struggle against being able to bring this back and then um, drawing cards off of it. Badmir New Blood is, again, um, the 2-2 two -two that whenever you commit a crime, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And then if it has four or more plus one, plus one counters on it, it has Menace and Lifelink. I do think that the, in the aggro and tempo space in black, this is going to be an interesting one to explore. So um, got three in here as, as it is a legendary. And then uh, Ran Executioner Thane is a payoff that kind of synergizes with the one ones off of Preacher of the Schism. So whenever a uh, one or more creatures you control die, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. And the, this ability triggers only once each turn. So it kind of gives you something that you can do with some of your cheaper stuff that you can trigger off of Ashnod Flesh Mechanist. Um, Corpse of the Lost, I've been playing around with just as a 3-2 um, with haste that kind of recurs uh, if you have descended. So you need a permanent to enter your graveyard, um, but this then you can return it to your hand for one life and play it again as, an, as a kind of recurring aggressive threat. Uh, Lord Skitter Sewer King commits a crime every turn, has nice synergies with Vadmir, um, I think we're going to see a lot of that happening um, and might, we might need to bump up Lord Skitter from one copy to four. Um, but four copies of Preacher of the Schism to create a bunch of one ones uh, fodder and then soul transfer. If we have a particularly problematic threat, we can exile something or we can use it to return a uh, creature from the graveyard to our hand or yeah, to our hand. And then um, one copy of the Invasion of Innistrad, which Again, it's just kind of in there as a um, Hail Mary situation. <laughs> if we do come up against um, some like indestructible creature, being able to give it minus 13, minus 13 gets around that. Um, and then you can flip it over to an enchantment that kind of helps you go uh, transition from aggro into mid range. So uh, playing around with the idea of bringing in one copy there. One copy of Aklazot's Deepest Betrayal. It's a classic one, uh, one of that we've seen in a lot of decks in standard uh, stabilizes against the near aggro and, and mono red as long as you can survive until turn five. And then um, it creates one one flyers that fit into the general one one fodder theme going on in the, in the deck with Preacher and Lord Skitter. Um, and then it can come back to your hand as well. So just nice recurring threat and then two copies of Gix's command because I love this card, the flexibility of it, as well as it just being an absolute blowout in certain circumstances against like uh, Boros Convoke and such. So, yeah, and then this one has just got a whole bunch of basic lands and one Mishra's Foundry. And last but not least is Boros Convoke. And so I've been playing around with a couple of different versions of Boros Convoke throughout the weeks of uh, Murders at Karlov Manor. Um, I went all the way from like mono white with just running the Imidane's Recruiter. Um, Played around with the idea of just getting rid of the, yeah, the Voldarian Epicures and the Gleeful Demolition and running more of a strictly white mana base. Um, but I, I think that one was slightly inferior to the Boros Convoke list that um, we've been seeing more in the best of one ladder. So I did cut Gleeful Demolition down to three copies. I do find sometimes it to be, I, I do find it to be aggravating sometimes when you have three copies of Gleeful Demolition in your hand and no artifacts on the board. <laughs> So I think uh, a nice balance is to bring this one down to three. Um, brought in four copies of the Novice Inspector, which gives us the artifact to hit with Gleeful Demolition. And the new card that I'm excited to check out from Outlaws is Requisition Raid. So you get a it's a spree card for one white that you can destroy target artifact, destroy target enchantment or put a plus one plus one counter on each creature that target player controls. So I'm kind of curious if this works at like a, a, a case of the Gateway Express where uh, pumping everything permanently is going to um, be able to build it. So it's sorcery speed, um, but similar to playing like the Imidane's Recruiter, giving everything plus one plus one. I'm curious to see how this plays, especially in the mirror match, being able to destroy other case of the Gateway Express or the War Leader's Call. Um, I'm not sure how many copies 
is going to be ideal. So I started out uh, started out things with two. Um, we've got four copies of Voldarian Epic here, uh, which is similar to the Novice Inspector, creates a token when it ETBs. Warden of the Inner Sky allow, uh, can be, you know, you can then tap those tokens to give it plus one, plus one, and then it can become a very large threat. Uh, Yoshin Frontliner uh, has the synergies. You can use Gleeful Demolition straight on the Frontliner, and I've really liked having a low curve with lots of one drops in this uh, archetype. Three copies of the Case of the Gateway Express has been kind of the sweet spot for me. And um, I have been enjoying the Case of the Gateway Express over the War Leader's Call, but again, it is a little bit matchup dependent. Um, one copy of Get Lost, which I really like because of the Destroy Enchantment effect. So this will give us three potential Destroy Enchantments for up against other War Leader's Calls and uh, Case of the Gateway Express, or problematic enchantments just in general. Um, four copies of the Resolute Reinforcements to go wide, four copies of the Emidane's Recruiter for pumping the board, two copies of the Sanguine Evangelist. Um, this one is one that I've played around with having two, three copies of, four copies of, and I think two works pretty well. Um, and then one copy of Aurelia, the Law Above, which is kind of um, maybe more fun than it is truly optimal, but being able to attack with five or more creatures Lightning Helix them for three damage and three life and draw a card on a decently statted like a, a flying vigilance haste for five. I like having one and then uh, four copies of Knight Errant of Eos, which is the downside with Aurelia is that it, your Knight Errant of Eos won't hit Aurelia unless you're convoking for um, five. So a lot of times you're convoking for three or less. And um, so then you won't be able to hit the Aurelia. Uh, that's the one kind of non synergy. And then the other thing is the eternal debate about how to approach the lands in <laughs> Oros Convoke. I'm a fan of Thran Portal. I like being able to have the access to one white and one red untapped on turn one. Um, maybe I won't need it as much because we did get the inspiring vantage, which is the fast land for Boros. So it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or fewer other lands. So this may give us an alternative to the Thran portals, but I'm going to run them in addition instead of the Sundown Pass, which is the slow land, which uh, has been frustrating for me in this archetype. So um, that's it, though. And uh, again, I hope you were able to see the cards well enough. It's not ideal. I'd like to be able to do this on Arena where I know it, it, it looks better. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Remember to click like and subscribe as a free way to help support me and uh, look at membership as a potential way to financially support me if you so choose. Uh, it is greatly, greatly appreciated. So thank you to my YouTube members, as always. And I'm uh, really excited for Outlaws at Thunder Junction. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Um, always love to hear your guys' ideas and brews that you're thinking are going to be a thing. And, uh, you know, um, check out my Discord. We've got a nice growing Magic the Gathering community there. Um, although it is a little bit more geared towards limited as I do, I do a lot of draft, um, and then kind of do constructed on the side. So, um, but it's still a place that I want to grow into a place, uh, where we can kind of bounce ideas off of each other and, um, brew ideas for decks and just general magic nerdery. So <laughs> I hope you're all excited for outlaws at thunder junction and, um, good luck with your games and maybe I'll see you on the ladder. <laughs>